everyone, and welcome to the Friends of Korea webinar series. We have an exciting program for you tonight, and Ekaterina will introduce our guest speaker tonight in a few moments. And uh, this is just a reminder that Friends of Korea does a variety of activities, not only these webinars, we have our annual meetings. It will be in Portland this year, the first weekend in November. We try to stay involved in all activities that foster friendship and cross-cultural understanding between Koreans and Americans, and actually Koreans and people from all over the world. We originally started off as a Peace Corps-centric organization, meaning a lot of people who had served in the Peace Corps in Korea were actually the founders of Friends of Korea, but our membership has truly expanded. And so that now we include uh, people with any kind of uh, interest and link to Korea, and that includes somebody doing research there, maybe you taught there, uh, maybe you're just interested in Korea because of the uh, K-boom throughout the world. So uh, www.friendsofkorea.net is our uh, website. Please come and visit, and our membership dues are very affordable, too. So without further ado, ECAT, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Okay, thank you so much, Jerry, for the introduction to Friends of Korea. Um, I would like to introduce our speaker today, our very own Bruce Fulton. Uh, so uh, Bruce occupies the Youngbin Min Chair in Korean Literature and Literary Translation at the University of British Columbia. He's the co-translator with Juchan Fulton of numerous works of modern Korean fiction. Uh, he is the recipient of a 2018 Manhe Grand Prize in Literature, and a co-author with Youngmin Kwan of What is Korean Literature uh, in 2020. He and Juchan Fulton received the first U.S. National Endowment for uh, the Arts Translation Fellowship for Korean Literary Work. Um, and uh, his most recent book-length translation with uh, Juchan Fulton is a novel, uh, uh, Togani by Kong ji in 2023. The Fulton's translations of Korean short fiction appear in journals such as the Massachusetts Review, uh, Granta, uh, Plowshares, and the Southern Review. So today, Bruce will be introducing uh, his new project, The Penguin Book of Korean Short Stories. And so with that, um, I would like to hand this uh, over to Bruce. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ecat and Jerry and Friends of Korea for allowing this opportunity to do one of my very favorite things in the whole wide world, and that's to talk about Korean literature. And uh, it's important to talk about Korean literature because everyone in the world knows about Hallyu, the Korean way of Korean popular culture, but literature doesn't get much attention. Now, why is that? Uh, Takeaway number one, we have to realize, first of all, that at the basis of much of the oral and performance aspects of Korean popular culture is Korean oral literature, the oral tradition in Korea that goes back thousands of years. But in the modern age, Korean literature is access not so much in its oral form as in its written form. Recorded literature, Girok Munak, which has always been an elite, conservative, and patriarchal tradition. It's something that doesn't neatly fall within the bounds of popular culture. But I'm here to try to dispel that myth with a collection of short stories short stories being the preferred and probably the most successfully developed uh, fictional genre in, in modern Korea. So first off, the Penguin Book of Korean Short Stories, published by Penguin UK, that is Penguin United Kingdom. I believe that's where Penguin originated. Over the decades, Penguin UK Thank you, Sun Young, for, for, showing, the, for showing the cover. Uh, over the decades, Penguin UK has published more than 3,500 world literary classics. The Penguin Book of Korean Short Stories is the very first volume 
of Korean literature among these 3,500 world classics. It's a historic anthology. And uh, as with um, every anthology, I owe thanks to a number of people. And I would like to thank, first of all, the contributors to the volume, the translators. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor Sun Young Park of the University of Southern California, translator uh, in collaboration with Jefferson Gatrall and Kevin O'Rourke of Pak Day One's wonderful Gubo story. Uh, most, so uh, I also take great pleasure in acknowledging translations by my former students at UBC. And I see that Nayang Bay is here, uh, translator of Chun and Young's Panel, a needlework story. Uh, I'd also like to mention uh, Cindy Chen. Cindy Chen is here today. And Cindy was the very first person, I'm sorry, the second person to have a translation of Pyeon He Young published. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to acknowledge Janet Hong, uh, very well known for her translations of contemporary Korean fiction and increasingly of manhwa, graphic novels. And uh, also, I'd like to acknowledge Daphne Zur, who contributed two wonderful translations to the anthology, but for reasons um, which would require me acquire require a separate rant I will uh, I will not disclose but um, I'm forever grateful to my students at UBC who uh, in the 20 plus years that I've been there have managed to get close to 200 translations mostly of green short fiction published um, also Kevin O'Rourke Kevin O'Rourke a whom I regard as our finest overall translator of Korean literature, uh, past and present, poetry and prose. He and I, this was a joint project on our part, a desire for many years to put together a, an anthology of fiction that uh, depended not so much on classroom exigencies in the class, the university classroom remains the primary market for translations of um, Korean literature, but simply translations that engaged us over the years uh, indeed compelled us to translate some of the works and uh, works that in our estimation survive as uh, English language works of literature. Kevin and I sent a proposal to Penguin England, uh, with whom we were connected by Jay Rubin, a professor of modern Japanese literature at the University of Washington and then at Harvard, who had published the Penguin Book of Japanese short stories and was kind enough to put us in touch with his editor, who in turn put us in touch with the editor that helped us. Uh, Jessica Harrison that helped us bring the Korean volume into play. Kevin, unfortunately, before the contract was signed, sustained uh, a cerebral hemorrhage that left him in a coma uh, from which he never recovered. So um, otherwise, he would be listed on the front of the book as the co-editor. Um, I like to think of him, and I mentioned him uh, as such in my preface as the spiritual co-editor of the volume. Uh, among the translators, I would also like to cite two invaluable mentors in my career in Korean literature and literary translation. Uh, the first of them, Kim Chong-un, a uh, professor in the Department of English Literature at Seoul Day. He was a specialist in Jewish American literature. I had the benefit of getting to know him 40 years ago when he was a visiting professor here in Seattle at the University of Washington. He taught courses in uh, colonial period short fiction. And uh, we decided, both of us, that we liked these stories so much, we decided to make an anthology out of them 
which resulted in a ready-made life. Um, early Masters of Modern Korean Fiction, published about 20 years ago by the University of Hawaii Press. Uh, also, Marshall Peel, the late Marshall Peel. Um, I got to know Marshall about 40 years ago uh, when um, he was directing the Harvard Summer School. Marshall was the first Westerner to gain a graduate degree at a Korean university. He first went to Korea uh, in the US military as an intelligence specialist, uh, quickly picked up uh, a command of the Korean language. Um, he was the first uh, Fulbright scholar to Korea. And I remember the day uh, almost 35 years ago when I called his home in the greater Boston area and spoke with his daughter, Sarah, who informed me that Marshall, after all this time, after getting a PhD at Harvard, had uh, a job offer from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And uh, it was there that Marshall finally found a full-time professorial job. Unfortunately, his life was cut short in, um, in 1995, but uh, already by then, he had invited Ju Chan and I to uh, share with him a, uh, a landmark anthology of post-1945 fiction, uh, Land of Exile, which uh, came out in 1993 and then in an expanded edition 2007. And finally, uh, well, next to finally, I want to thank Professor Gwen Young Min. Uh, he and I, uh, share a history going back about 40 years. Actually, I think we share a little bit of Inyan as well. He was born uh, on Chusuk uh, four days before I was in uh, 1948, whereas I was born on Hangalau, October 9th. So um, he has been a trusted friend, mentor, uh, fellow collaborator, and uh, he was kind enough to contribute the very impressive introduction to the volume. And so finally, my thanks go to my life partner, co-translator, uh, who deserves credit for putting up with me for 45 years, and that would be Ji Chan Fulton. And uh, she and I contribute, I think, close to close to half of the half of the translations. So what I'd like to do is. Uh, talk uh, a little bit. The anthology is is uh, arranged in five categories. I'd like to uh, spend a few minutes on one or two stories from each of the five categories, and uh, and I had planned to uh, conclude with a reading from the very last story, Kim Eun's wonderful story, Chumoke uh, Mire, The Future of Silence. Uh, I'm going to do that, but I figured I, I, I have so much fun doing readings. I figured I might also uh, do some very short readings from the very beginning of several of the stories. In one of my translation courses at the University of British Columbia, I always emphasized to my students how important it is to nail the title, the very first sentence, and the very first paragraph. And I emphasize that that is where they are going to either lose or gain the attention of the readers. So um, I, I'd like to do this uh, also as a way of describing the characteristics that I think contribute to a successful work of short fiction, be it Korean language, English language. And I think you will find in some of these, um, in some, hopefully all of the readings that I perform, um, a strong attention to detail, to physical description, to command of vocabulary, to word choice, and to rhythm. These, these are the elements that, uh, that contribute significantly to a successful um, work of literary fiction. So first, the first category is tradition, juntong. 
And the very first story in the anthology, one of my favorite stories of all time, a translation I did with the late Kim Jong-un, is Iho Suk's story, Memil Got Kilmudia, or if you uh, were born and raised in Kangwondo province, you, um, you pronounce it Momil Got Kilmudia. In fact, I think that was the original spelling of the, of the translation. What's important about this story? Well, there, there are two things that are important. And the first is itinerancy. So that's a fancy word that means no fixed abode and or no fixed place of business. You're on the road all the time. And what's the significance of this in Korean culture? Well, the class system. So many of those who found themselves, who found their lives on the road, who found their lives itinerant, were either outside the traditional class system of Chosun. So you all know that, right? San Nong Kong Song, scholars, farmers, artisans, people who work with their hands, and significantly at the very bottom, merchants. So, um, but these, um, but these individuals, uh, wherever they were in the class system or outside it, contributed significantly to Korean tradition um, in terms of economy and also a sense of community. And I can speak to this individually because my very first home in uh, Korea in 1978 was a village in North Chola province, Chalabukto, Jangsugun, Genemyeon, Jangiri. Jangiri was on a crossroads. And uh, if you went to the west, you'd get to Chunju, the provincial capital. If you went north, you'd go to Muju, uh, Muju Guchangdo, a, um, a popular retreat. If you went south, you'd get to Namwon, Namwon, site of, the, uh, of our uh, beloved Chunyang story. And if you went east, you'd cross the border into South Kyungsung province, Kyungsung Namdo. And soon you'd get to Hain Monastery, uh, notable for its repository of Buddhist uh, classics in woodblock editions. So uh, the, I lived with a family, not with a hasuk, with a family, and they had two sources of business, but one was a shoe shop. So every fifth day, the traditional oil, every fifth day market day, they would take a sample of their stock out to the marketplace and uh, as would all the other merchants in town. And there were still uh, merchants who would come from nearby towns and villages to display their wares. So we've got buying and selling going on, but also we have a sense of camaraderie, a sense of community, a sense of celebration of a centuries old tradition of, uh, of economic um, uh, buying buying and selling. And um, my good wife is um, telling me to uh, cut the time short because I tend to, to talk too long. One thing she didn't do is tell me to stop using my hands so much. <laughs> so um, that's the importance of that story. And the next story I like to cite because it's, in, it's an example of the very rich intertextual and increasingly intermedial quality of Korean literature. So intertextuality is a fancy word for what used to be called, um, oh, now I'm having, now I'm forgetting. What, um, what's the word? Ross King, are you there? Um, you take a story and you make, you make a new version of it that's often humorous. Parody, okay. So um, Kevin and I uh, picked up a story that uh, Ross King uh, originally translated, and then he took me on in a project uh, at UBC, a, a collection of, um, of parody stories, stories that are based on primarily on, uh, on folk tales from Korea. And this one, Cheman Chik's story, a man called Hungbo, Hungbo Shi, is based on the story of the two brothers, Hungbo and Nolbu, the, uh, the good brother and the bad brother. And uh, in this story, the good one, um, 
Hukbu is transported from uh, traditional Korea to the colonial period where he becomes kind of a humble um, odd jobs person at a local school. And I want to read you the very first paragraph of this story. Translation by Ross King and Ju Chun Fulton and myself. A Japanese lunchbox in one hand and a pint bottle of Chung Jung in the other. Betcha you're thinking this story is about the gentleman in the bowler hat and morning coat, or is it a frock coat? With the artificial flower pinned to his lapel, his face bearing a healthy sheen and a ruddy glow, a toothpick in his mouth, a man on his way home from some commemorative event, a public servant of note or the local Lord Muck. That's a British, this is a British publication, sorry about that. But actually we'll be concerned instead with the doings of good old Mr. Hyun, the odd jobs man at a primary school. So there you go, a one sentence uh, first paragraph and that's Che Man Sheik who had a, who had a gift for dialogue and, uh, and description. Next, uh, next in, uh, in terms of categories, women and men. Um, I, uh, Ju Chan and I throughout, well, from the very, almost the very beginning of our translation career have focused on women's writing. And so I thought it only fair that this section be titled women and men rather than men and women. And um, the very first story in this section translated by Professor Park, Sunyan Park in collaboration with Jefferson Gettrall and Kevin O'Rourke. This was Kevin O'Rourke's favorite story from the colonial period. It was a, it was a must include. And this is a, uh, this is a story that um, the scholars like to compare to uh, a French story um, involving a individual known as a flaneur. And uh, the flaneur is uh, someone, usually an intellectual, who likes to make his or her or their way about town, uh, taking in the sights, meeting people, just kind of enjoying life. And that's what we have with Gubo, uh, <clears throat> who, uh, which is the, um, the pen name, actually the ho, the sobriquet of the author, Pak Taewon. So we, of course, have to wonder if perhaps this story is autobiographical. And one of the delights in this story, in addition to the, to the wonderful translation, is the inclusion of illustrations by Pak Taewon's uh, colleague, E. Sung, who, uh, in addition to being a writer of note, was an, a prize-winning architect and also an artist. So you've got a real treat with, uh, with the Gubo story. I also want to mention this anthology is a collection of short fiction with the exception of the Gubo story and uh, Land of Exile, which might be classified as novellas. They're a little bit longer, but uh, they're all standalone stories except for an excerpt from a novel. And this is a very significant um, entrant in the anthology because the author is North Korean. His name is Hong Suk Jung, and he happens to be the grandson of the writer Hong Myung Hee who is known for any of you uh, who are interested in very long form fiction, the Deha Soso, the Great River Soso, the Roman Fleuve, the multi-volume historical novel, you um, will enjoy Ho Myung Hee's 10 volume novel, Im Kuk Jung, about a historical bandit from Chosun times, regarded by some as kind of a, um, a fictional encyclopedia of traditional Korean culture. So Hong Suk Jung, uh, unlike many of his contemporaries, uh, did not, as far as I know, make his mark 
in the tried and true North Korean tradition of socialist realism, but went back in time to Huang Jini, an iconic Gisang, professional entertaining woman from early Chosun, uh, born in what is now North Korea in um, Huanghe province, and reconstructs a life that involves not so much her liaisons with a series of Chosun worthies, which a raft of modern Korean fiction writers have seized upon, but instead are building her, uh, are portraying her in terms of a coming of age story in which her partner is a commoner named Nom or Nomi. And um, I'd like to, in terms of, um, I'd like to read you the very first paragraph or so of this excerpt. This is an excerpt from a novel that was written, I think, in three lengthy parts. And Ju Chan and I have had the great pleasure. We've translated the first part so far. And we are involved in the arduous process of trying to contact Hong Suk Chung, and we're told that this will never happen, but we're doing our best. So this is a chapter from Huang Jini by Hong Suk Chung, translated by myself and Ju Chun. It was a day of cloud and wind, the time of year when summer begins to give way to autumn and already a few leaves were dropping from branches to be sent whirling into the, into the sky. From south gate, a flock of dusky sparrows took flight, looping about the slate gray sky before scattering like a shower of dark hail among the paddies and dry fields beyond the city wall to feast upon the newly ripened grain. Overhead, a lone crow uttered an eerie caw drawing looks of displeasure from passers-by who then answered this ill-omened bird by spitting over their shoulder. There was a desolate feel to the day. Since early morning, would-be spectators had been gathering along the gully between the foot of Chanam Mountain and the wall behind Wang Jinsa's dwelling, Wang Jinsa, the father of Wang Jini. In anticipation of the funeral procession, for young Tobok of Granary Row. Word had got out that the pallbearers would probably be passing this way, and the lane that ran along the gully was filled before the morning sun had crested the ridges, and the mountainside as far as Prominence Rock now wore a snowy blanket of onlookers garbed in their traditional white attire. Okay, that's the end of the reading. What are all these people out for? They want to catch sight of Huang Jini who already has established a reputation. And Tobok, young Tobok, is a boy that sneaked over the wall to ask her to write something and grew so much in love with her and so heart sick he died of um, a broken heart. So his funeral procession is coming by the back wall of Wang Jin Sun's residence. Is Jinny going to appear? You're going to have to read the story to find out. Okay, so uh, on then to category number three, and this is peace and war. So once again, of course, we've got war and peace from Leo Tolstoy, but uh, we thought it was better to put the peace first because as, as all of you know, technically <laughs> the two Koreas are still in a state of war, a formal peace treaty. Uh, having never been signed. And so in this small way, um, we're hoping like so many others for peace finally. So this starts with a story by Huang Sun Wan. Huang Sun Wan short fiction was a subject of my dissertation at Seoul National University. Um, he was a man that uh, I met early on, that Ju Chan and I enjoyed a 20-year relationship with. Uh, a wonderful man and the most accomplished writer of short fiction in modern Korea, in my humble opinion. 
title of his story, it's an iconic story in Korean, it's Noa Naman Ui Shigan, Noa Naman Ui Shigan. In our translation, Time for You and Me. So the Time for You and Me works as, um, uh, as a title of what is essentially a battlefield survival story. But it also reflects Huang Sun Wan's approach to his readers. Now, Huang Sun Wan is uh, distinctive among many uh, ways in being very respectful of his readers. Um, flip side of that is he didn't have much respect for uh, Munak Pyongyonga, which is how the majority of scholars in Korea style themselves, not as scholars, Hakcha, but as. Uh, those who issue critiques, uh, evaluators, gatepost keepers, cynically speaking. So um, evidence of this, many of his stories uh, are open-ended. So instead of uh, beating his readers over the head, you know, this is what you need to learn to pass the university entrance examination. I'll leave it up to you. You can engage as you will. Uh, also, among the three stories in this section is a story by the late, great Pogwam So, a wonderful, wonderful person and a very empathic person, a person uh, through whose authorial creative testimony, many of the stories she writes about uh, reflect experiences she herself had, uh, was able to reach so many readers that she assumed the iconic status of the Yap Chip Hajima, the auntie next door, because in so many of her narratives, her narratives have this oral, O-R-A-L, and also aural, A-U-R-A-L quality, that if you're reading one of her stories, you can almost imagine yourself listening to her on your, um, on your veranda, on your, on your maru, and she's peeking over the fence and saying, hmm, that reminds me of, of something like that. She was a wonderful person. And um, at her passing, her passing was um, attended by an outpouring of grief, second only in recent uh, Korean history to the passing of Cardinal Kim Soo Hwan. So, um, the, uh, the translation um, of Kyo Nadiri um, is, by, is by Marshall Arpeel. It's a, it's a wonderful story. Next, Hell Chosun. What the hell is Hell Chosun? Well, um, I, would, uh, I would suggest that the term dates back to the Chosun period, our most recent uh, kingdom. Uh, dynasty, as some people prefer to think of it, from 1392 to 1910, a time when the hope of any self-respecting clan uh, on the Green Peninsula was to place a son in the bureaucracy. A son, by definition, the bureaucracy and the examination, the quago that gave entrance to it, was open only to men. So what do you do? Well, you basically lose your childhood. You're sent to a, to a village where, uh, where a village elder in a tutamagi, traditional Korean overcoat, has got a switch in his hand, and he's making sure you memorize the, south, the, south, the thousand character classic. And if you're not, well, you're going to get a spanking across the legs. But this is how you gained a foothold, a pyoso rank in the bureaucracy, which, of course, behooved not just you, but your entire clan. Um, some would liken the modern counterpart to this to be the university entrance exam. Um, from an early age, students whose Parents have the resources, will attend school, but will also be spending several hours a day at the notorious Hagwon, the cram schools. Hagwon is kind of a euphemism. And um, for the all important entrance to the university, uh, to a, a university 
uh, not only a university of one's choice, but I think also you apply to a specific department. So it's very, it's very iffy and uh, that's still in place. But more generally, uh, we see discontent among the younger, younger generation uh, who dutifully went through this, uh, this exam hell, often uh, getting support from parents to go overseas for, uh, uh, for part or all of their study, which could include uh, PhD. They come back to Korea and many of them aren't finding jobs that they consider appropriate to uh, all of the, uh, the study that they and supported by their parents have invested in education. Uh, they find themselves not advancing through the, the ranks of either the government bureaucracy or the companies they work for. Uh, women in particular have suffered the usual, the glass ceiling and so forth, although my understanding is that they fare much better now in the, uh, in the government ministries. Uh, but also we're seeing some social um, indications of this malaise of Hill Chosun in the form of the highest suicide rate among the OECD nations, uh, a negative birth rate, um, Korea now has a, has a, um, a very high um, uh, uh, component of uh, senior citizens. And uh, recently, um, I've heard the, the, latest, um, the latest entry to the Hill Chosun uh, concept, and that's the four no's, the um, no sex, no dating, no marriage, no children. So, um, Declining birth rate, there you go. So um, the very first example from the Hell Chosun stories is um, Yi Song's iconic story, Nalge, or Wings, um, and, which ends with um, the protagonist on the, <clears throat> on the roof of the Mitsukoshi department store. So uh, Japan's very first, <clears throat> or uh, Colonial Korea's very first department store, Japanese created and owned, of course, and um, Nary is hoping he can fly. Um, is he, what does this mean? Is he going to take his own life? Is he going to symbolically <clears throat> transcend his, his uh, situation in Colonial Korea? But um, the beginning of this story is kind of fun. I'd like to read that for you. And this is a translation by Kevin O'Rourke. Have you ever met a stuffed genius? Look no farther. I feel good about being one too. Makes me feel good about romance too. It's only when my body creaks with fatigue, my mind begins to glint like a silver coin. Nicotine takes over my wormy tummy and a clean page opens in my mind where I can plop down and my paduk stones of wit and paradox. It's known as the awful disease of common sense. So that's Wings. And uh, following Wings, we have another uh, classic story from the early 1960s. And this was a period that comes after the short-lived triumph of democracy in the form of the April 19th, 1960 student revolution that resulted in the resignation of the first president of the Republic of Korea, Lee Sung Man, popularly known to the West as Sing Man Ri, and a short lived caretaker government, but which 13 months later was overthrown in a military coup led by young generals centered in Park Chung-hee, Park Chung-hee. Three years later, Kim Sung-ok writes a story that captures the mood of what it's like in a society that briefly enjoyed a period of democracy only to be re turned to a gloomier 
uh, and colder environment, thus the title of the story, Seoul, Winter, 1964. First paragraph, this is, is also a translation by Marshall Peale, one of my favorite translations. And here's the opening paragraph. Anyone who spent the winter of 1964 in Seoul, this could apply today as well, would probably remember those stalls that appear on the streets once it got dark, selling hutch putch, roasted, roasted sparrow, and three kinds of booze made so that to step inside you had to lift a curtain being whipped by a bitter wind that swept the frozen streets, where the long flame of a carbide lamp inside fluttered with the gusts, where a middle-aged man in a dyed army jacket poured drinks and roasted snacks for you. Well, it was in one of those stalls that the three of us happened to meet that night. By the three of us, I mean myself, a graduate student named Ahn who wore thick glasses, and a man in his mid-thirties of whom I knew nothing except that he was obviously poor, a man whose particulars actually I hadn't the least desire to know. And um, question number one, uh, what kind of a, what are these stalls? Okay, don't have to tell me now, save it for the question and answer session. But what is it that Kim Sung Wook is, is describing that is such an important part of, of urban street culture? Okay, I also want to mention the next story is by Oh Jung Hee. It's called Wayfarer, uh, our translation of her, of her story, Sule Jai Nore literally uh, song, a Wayfarer's song. And uh, this is one of those stories, there are a few I can cite, that when both of us read it, and um, I, I, I read this story first in Korean, as Ju Chan did, we almost immediately felt a compulsion to, to translate it. It is, um, it's, a very, very engaging story. And um, I want to mention that in conjunction with the career of Oh Jung Hee. Oh Jung Hee has been publishing since 1969. That's well over 50 years. But she remains very much underappreciated in modern Korean literary history. And I learned recently that she has been elected an honorary fellow of the Modern Language Association, which is one of the premier language and literature scholarly organizations in the world, centered in New York. And among the other two fellows elected this year, one of them is the Japanese writer Oe Kanzabiro, winner of the Nobel Prize some years back. So I mention this in hopes that Oh Jung Hee will finally gain the attention she deserves. And um, heads up, our next proposal to Penguin UK will be the best of Oh Jung Hee. Please. Keep your fingers crossed for us. Uh, I also want to mention the piece by Shin Kyung Soo, or as her agent prefers to market her in English, Kyung Soo Shin. Um, this is an example of what we call in Korea a conte. That's from the French word conte, C O M T E. Basically, think of it as a somewhere in between a short story and an example of flash fiction. And uh, Shin Young Suk is very good at these. We, we translated, I think, two or three of, of these works by her. And this is interesting because it's a ghost story, but it's um, very catchy. So please keep that one in mind. And finally, that brings us to Into the New World and Oh boy! In the end of my in the end of my presentation, I was um, I was going to read from the beginning of the very last story, Kim Ae the Future of Silence. But in the interest of time, and I always like to reserve 
plenty of time for you folks, uh, talk, questions, etc. cetera. So um, I'll simply say, read the, um, uh, read the story and try to, uh, try to hold your breath for about a page and a half until you find out who the narrator of the story is. This is, um, this is a wonderful story. It's, um, um, Kim Aaron has done an exceptional job of researching the story. Uh, it's a story about endangered languages. And as Professor Guan notes at the very end of the introduction, when a language dies, it is no longer possible for an anthology such as this one. So, um, oh, and uh, one other thing, and forgive me for this, Penguin UK um, has not done a very adequate job of publicizing and marketing this book, and I'm guessing that they are resting on their considerable laurels. I understand that, but we need reviews. We need we need some noise. So if you like what you read, make it known, please. And um, as always, we welcome constructive criticism. So um, that brings my um, spiel to an end. And uh, I'd welcome questions, comments, brick bats. Well, um, I will try to uh, moderate this as best as I can. So if you have a question, please use either the raise hand function on Zoom, or you can type your question in the chat. Uh, when, you, uh, when I see your raised hand, I'll call on you by name and ask you to unmute yourself. Um, and then if you could just briefly, you know, give a brief introduction as well, that'd be great. But you don't have so um, does anyone have any questions, comments? Uh, use the raise hand feature. All right, uh, we have uh, Michael. Yes. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, first, thank you so much for this talk. This was fascinating. Um, I, sorry, I'll lower my hand here. How do I do that? Uh, um, so I'm Mike Ormsby. I'm a graduate student at the University of Rochester. Uh, and for the past few years, I've been teaching first year writing classes, um, some of them uh, based on um, Korean popular culture. And something I've been trying to do is to find ways to having to use mostly um, materials in English, uh, try to push beyond sort of popular to Korean history, Korean literature, things like that. And so I was wondering, would you recommend uh, one or any of these stories in the collection um, or other stories in, in translation for first year students in university? Yeah, for uh, certainly one, uh, one of the characteristics of uh, Korean recorded literature that is uh, basically what we're, what we're accessing in the modern period and uh, is a, uh, is a function of the Korean literature power structure, the Mundan, the, this being the collection of, of scholars, literary critics, um, publishers, uh, quasi government organizations. There's always been an emphasis on hyunshil, which something, which is a word that means uh, present day reality, literally. So there's always been a strong expectation that fiction writers reflect um, what's going on in society, what's going on in modern Korean history. And um, anyone who has, has ever lived in Korea can, can feel how fast the country has evolved and how fast it continues to evolve. Uh, and it's been a very tumultuous history. So. Um, you, readers can learn uh, a lot about Korean history, culture, society, class relations, gender relations 
from the stories in this anthology. Um, also, uh, I would like to think that Kevin O'Rourke and I came up with a selection of stories that uh, indicate a variety of literary styles in terms of um, narrative, dialogue, um, the, um, the, the spoiler for the, uh, the last story, the, the future silence, the, the answer to the question, who the narrator, the narrator is the spirit of the last surviving speaker of a language. So um, this is what I would call a posthumous narrative or um, a, a voice from beyond the pale, I guess, if you want to conceptualize it like that. So uh, we're seeing not only the tried and true representations of lived experience, but we're seeing a, a constant development of, uh, of literary style. And this is one thing I always emphasize, uh, the importance of a, of a literary translation is, uh, is an engaging subject along with an appropriate style. So yes, I think, I think this anthology would be uh, a good introduction. Uh, we've, uh, we've had criticism from the Academy that uh, very few of the translations are first time translations. I, I, that doesn't bother me at all. Um, a lot of the translations, the reasons that they, you know, they've been previously published in some cases more than once is that they've endured. So uh, they've, they've got good shelf life. So yes, I think your students will um, appreciate what they read and uh, I'll be happy to refund their purchase price if they're dissatisfied. Thank you very much. Not for the refund, that, that won't be necessary, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes, an expensive book. Oh, um, by, this reminds me. Uh, so the book that's now available is a cloth. It's a very weighty cloth edition from Penguin UK. Um, Penguin US is scheduled to release a paperback edition, I'm told in April. I'm trying to move that up at least until January. Okay, and if you haven't seen the link to the UK uh, edition, I have put it in the chat, and I'm going to put it in the chat one more time now. So you can take a look and see um, the description. Um, if you, are there any other questions, please use your raise hand feature or uh, send it in the chat. Um, I don't see a raised hand, but Jerry, you mentioned that you had a uh, a question as well. Yeah, I do. Uh, Bruce, thanks so much for this presentation. And I just want to express my admiration and respect for you and Juchan and all your colleagues for all your work in this. The amount of uh, linguistic and cultural knowledge involved in a project like this is incredible. So hats off to all of you. And I had um, three questions, I guess. <laughs> One is... <laughs> You know, you were talking about themes in a sense, too. And, you know, there are certain cultural concepts that people say that are unique, uniquely Korean. <clears throat> and the one I'm thinking of is Han, you know, the that sense of sorrow or resentment or unresolved emotions. And it could be from historical or personal experiences. Do you see, number one, I guess, or A, part A to this question is, is that... Uh, uh, a real concept that you see in the literature? And if you do, how much do you see it? So that's a question about Han. And um, second question is, what is your personal favorite period of Korean literature? And the third question is, where is it most advantageous for you and the other translators for us to buy a copy? Okay, uh, first, Han. So, um, as with any culture that you're experiencing for the first time, it's helpful to have um, concepts that over the decades of centuries have become what we might think of as cliches or stereotypes. 
and Han is is one of them. So as as you mentioned, Jerry, we can understand it as bitterness, resentment, resignation, um, unjust, you know, a feeling of unjust um, uh, rancor, R A N C O R, a fancy word. So um, I think this is a helpful way to understand the mood of many uh, modern Korean stories. I would prefer to think of Han as a means of historical memory. So this is um, this is a concept, and forgive me, I don't mean this to sound, uh, I, I, I dislike jargon, but uh, the more that we translate, the more I get to know about modern Korean history, the more I realize how much of it has been consigned to dark corners of Korean history. And specifically, I'd like to mention a novel that Ju Chan and I translated it was published in 2020. Our translation is called One Left. The original Korean novel is Han Myung, literally one person. And it is the very first, if you can believe this, it's the very first Korean novel, Jung Kim So Sol, to focus exclusively on the so called comfort women. And in that, um, and the author Kim Soon rigorously researched, she researched the testimony of the how many, the survivors, the very limited number. And in this novel, we find out that more than 200,000 Korean girls, and they were girls when they were taken, were either forcibly taken or were led to believe their families were led to believe that they were being taken to places, factories where they could earn income to remit to their parents. More than 200,000 of these girls were taken from their ancestral villages and not until, and this, this is in the, in the late 1930s, um, almost a hundred years ago, uh, a very limited por a portion of them survived to return to Korea and it wasn't until 1991 that the first of them went public, Kim Hak Sun. And then it wasn't until 2016 that we have a novel about the about this about this experience. So, uh, for reasons I think that you can understand, the the history, the background of the comfort wound has been shrouded all this time, and by publishing this work for Kim Soom and for us to translate it is a way of retrieving the identities of these girls, these 200,000 plus girls. Uh, we're restoring the historical memory. This is not going to be pleasant for a lot of people, but it's necessary for healing and closure. And I think that um, um, that Han can be, um, can kind of stimulate a desire for one's voice to be heard. And in a traditional class society, in a traditional gendered society, we have a lot of voice, and more recently in Korean history, ideologically, a lot of voices that have been silenced um, can now be heard. Uh, not only publicly, but through literature and uh, artistically as well as politically. So that's that's my take on Han. Um, favorite period, favorite period of, of Korean literature. Um, a couple. One of my favorite periods is Koryo. Why Koryo? This is um, now. Remind me. Is this nine nine? 10th century to 1392 in Chosen's book. Why Koryo? Koryo is where we see a flowering of oral literature. And the voices that we hear in that flowering are not the voices of men who stuck to writing at first in classical Chinese and even until uh, well after the 
Korean script was invented by the great King Sejong, who was kind enough to promulgate it in 1446 on my birthday, October 9th. So uh, what I like from the Koryo period are the songs, the Koryo songs. Most of them are love songs. Many of them, uh, well, some of them we, we think were, were uh, composed by, by Buddhist monks. I think others came from the oral tradition. They're, they're, they sound very much like women's voices. And uh, one of the reasons I hold Kevin O'Rourke in such high regard is that about 15 years ago, he published a collection of translations of these songs and of Yanga, literally songs of home, the earliest uh, examples we have from the Korean oral tradition, as well as um, precursors of Shijo, the vernacular short verse form, and also poems written in Chinese in an anthology of verse from Shila and Koryo. And on the back of this volume, you'll see me, um, you'll see an endorsement that's similar to what I said at the beginning. So that's, um, that's one of my favorite periods, but um, modern Korean fiction, that was my focus at uh, Seoul National University and it remains the focus of our of, uh, the translations that Ju Chan and I have, have done over the decades. Okay, where to buy them? Um, direct from the publisher in some cases, University of Hawaii Press. Uh, we've published, I think, four, four or five volumes there. Um, if you order $100 worth of books, free post, free delivery. Um, what is Korean literature? The, uh, the book that Kwon Young Min uh, authored and he brought me in on it. Uh, that is available direct from the publisher, the Institute of uh, East Asian Studies, the University of California, Berkeley. Um, I'm not uh, very savvy about, uh, about, about online ordering. Um, <coughs> um, if on the other hand, you're talking about uh, translations of novels, which would be the subject of a rant on my part, then of course you've got commercial publishers to deal with. But um, I hope um, for those of you new to Korean fiction, you'll stick to short fiction, a variety of, um, um, actually I include in the, in the Penguin volume, a list of suggested readings uh, a short fiction authors included in the volume, authors not included in the volume, anthologies, and um, eyes up. Okay, I have to make sure I look up. So um, please um, have a have a glance at the um, at those suggestions and happy reading. All right. Uh, do we have any more uh, questions? Uh, please use raise hand function or send us a word in the chat. Oh, no one's going to ask me about uh, famous authors who don't appear in the anthology. Oh, we have we have Carol. Um, Carol, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? My question has to do with the um, uh, Penguin Anthology. Uh, are, are these available in most large libraries? They should be, but the, the book was published in late April in the UK. And I'm sure they'll be available in libraries in due course, but uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure whether libraries are a priority of uh, Penguin UK at this point. As I mentioned before, I've been disappointed with their marketing publicity. Um, I'm guessing that it may not be until the Penguin US paperback edition comes out uh, as late as April, but hopefully 
uh, earlier than that, that uh, we'll see ready access in university libraries and um, public libraries. Um, but I, I'm attempting to address that here in Seattle, uh, scheduling a reading at the, at the central branch of the Seattle Public Library, which has a nice big auditorium. So what, uh, what Penguin UK is not doing, Juchan and I always try to do. So I hope that um, you'll have a library copy sooner rather than later. And uh, I like your uh, I like your background. I want to I want to mention that uh, this uh, motion key reminds me of something I did in my first home in Korea <laughs> 45 years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's me with the hat on over 50 years ago. Wow. All right. Thank you for your question, Carol. Um, do we have any, if you have any more uh, questions, we can use the raise hand feature, but I also want to be cognizant of everyone's time. So um, if there are no more pressing questions, then we'll wrap up. But uh, now's a great opportunity to ask any questions if you have them. Oh, there's a, uh, so um, Michael has a follow-up question in the chat. Uh, you mentioned the list of authors not included in the collection. Is there enough time to say a few words, uh, uh, to say a few of the authors you had in mind? Oh, yes. Um, and I will try to avoid going into a rant. But um, the Korean literature power structure, which I've mentioned uh, a few times, the Mundan, is desperate for any international attention. And so five years ago, a, an English version of a Korean literary work earned a prize in Great, uh, Great Britain, England. And the author of the Korean work was suggested to me by the editors of Penguin simply because she had come to the attention of British readers through this, through the English version of her, uh, what was a linked story um, work of fiction, three novellas called Chesik Juicha. What the uh, Penguin editors didn't realize is that if you're publishing something about Korean literature, you have to be an old timer. You have to be retired and no longer active because you don't talk about other authors who are currently active. That's just, that's just not done. Ju Chan and I selected a story by this author that we thought reflected her style better than the existing English versions which are more in the vein of my version of such and such a story. They're not really translations. But when it came time to clear copyright for the contents of the anthology and a, uh, a staff member at Penguin UK was tasked with this, um, with this chore, the agent for the author wanted to read our translation in order to in order to give permission. And we thought that was ridiculous. That's a boundary you don't cross. So that story was denied. That our translation of that author was denied. Another author, one of the most important living authors, he, uh, his classic story, it's a story I use at UBC in two of my courses, was translated by our very first PhD from UBC, Daphne Zur. When the agent was contacted about that translation, the agent said, Oh, we already have a translator for this author. So uh, maybe that translator should review this translation and then we can make a judgment. 
So once again, uh, no. And what is unfortunate about this author and translation is that the author whom we have been in touch with, we first translated this author 40 years ago, he said that he wanted the story included. The publisher or the agent said, I'm sorry, uh, our author does not want this translation included. He said, she said. There were two other authors who were not included. Um, for uh, one, in the case of uh, the author who was recently deceased and uh, had become disgruntled over the decades with his reception in English translation, and the son probably felt out of filial duty to respect his father's wishes. And then uh, the fourth story also by a major writer who's achieved a measure of commercial success in English translation uh, simply said no and uh, he is otherwise on record as saying that he doesn't like readers closely examining his stories. So um, the takeaway from this is that the that way. process of translating Korean literature into English and publishing it has become in the last 10 or 15 years because of the advent of literary agents, Korean publishers representatives and increasing pressure from Korean institutes it's become an increasingly commercial and, in my view, mercenary enterprise. So that's why four major authors are not included in this anthology. But fortunately, the ones that remain, I think, more than make up for their absence. OK. Thank you so much, and Michael's comments. Thank you very much for your explanation and for the talk. Okay, and so I think on this note, we're kind of running up against, we're a little over time. So I think now would be a good time for any final comments from you, Bruce, uh, that you would like to make, and we will uh, wrap up our webinar. Well, th thank you once again, and uh, again, my thanks to all those who contributed to the anthology. Um, I spend a lot of time, I, I wrote a chapter for the uh, book, U.S. Peace Corps Volunteers, Peace Corps Volunteers and the Making of Korean Studies in the U.S., and my chapter is entitled Serendipity, Uyan, and Inyan. Uh, serendipity is described in the dictionaries. You discover something, you make good use of it. Inyan, uh, we could think of, is often understood in Korea as a matter of fate or destiny. It's sometimes understood as prior connection. And Uyan, um, happenstance, um, opportunity. Um, these three concepts have shaped my life in ways that I, I never could have imagined. Um, I came to Korea in 1978 um, by a very circuitous process. And ever since then, Korea has claimed my life. Um, and so I welcome the opportunity to try to contextualize uh, what I've been able to do in the last 40 years um, by acknowledging the um, how, how precious uh, I feel it was. I, I, I don't think of discovering Korea. I think of Korea as discovering me. And um, as my Korean English co-teacher said very shortly after I met him in April of 1978, he said, we are Pyongyang Chingu. We are lifelong friends. And that's how I look at my life with Korea. So 
thank you once again for sharing and happy reading. All right. Thank you, Jerry. Any final words? If you enjoyed tonight's program, and we want to thank Bruce for this wonderful presentation. And so if you enjoy programming like this, again, consider joining Friends of Korea, www.friendsofkorea, all one word, dot net. And membership is very affordable. If you'd like to purchase a membership for a student out there, a student of Korean literature, it's $10 a year. Uh, the annual membership for everybody else is $25. And if you'd like to do a lifetime membership, it's $250. I'd also like to say that Friends of Korea is a completely volunteer organization. Our COO gets paid $1 a year. All board members serve as volunteers. And we really try to contribute back to uh, Korean American uh uh, culture and society here, and also to Korea too. So in our giving back initiative, we funded students to go study in Korea. We've contributed to uh, senior citizens organizations, uh, Korean senior citizen organizations in the United States, uh, mental health issues for Asian Americans, et cetera. So we're trying to give back uh, while we can as an organization. So once again, Bruce, thank you very much. Thanks to Ekaterina for doing the wonderful job, to, you know, monitoring and moderating and organizing this. And thanks to all of you for attending tonight. Really appreciate it.